This is the GPL Podcast, part of the Pull Tab Sports family. You're younger than my dad. Oh. <laughs> my dad's 50, my dad's 56. You're so younger 56. than my dad. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> And, and Eric, on the flip side, I bet you you just love those defensive games. I mean, <laughs> yeah, if, if I'm playing, why? Well, I was I was the same as you, Drew. If I fell asleep on Saturday, like, <laughs> eat, eat, eat that Todd, eat that Todd, <laughs> eat that Schloss, <laughs> eat that Drew. Now here's Jupiter and Vigo. Good evening and welcome to the GPL podcast, episode number 262. And Viggs, of course, I had to grab that video with Cappy last week saying, eat that, Todd, eat that, Schloss, eat that, Drew, because of our guest tonight. That's right. Cappy's catching up, but it's going to be a while, I think, before he can catch Todd Molesky. Well, let's bring him in. Todd Molesky, there he is. Our favorite guy who covers the Badgers, probably our only favorite guy of the Badgers, but you know. (laughs) You know, it was good to see that the Big Ten Network recognizes how to cover hockey last week. Oh, I love that one. Boy, I'm I'm saving that clip for Cappy the next time he's on. (laughs) Bring it. We we all know hockey is an afterthought. It (laughs) it just is. And it's going to get worse in the next couple of years. Well, I, I, I... I had BTN worse, plus. Is, I, got, I mean, I worse watch is a, games. sure. Worse is a way of putting it. It's different is another way of putting it. Um, <sighs> you know, okay. Talking to Cappy Saturday night, he's like, "This series is over. Why don't we just go right down to Madison and cover?" Mm-hmm. He's like, "He." I think he was kind of disappointed too. Why? Why can't we just do this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's, it's show me the money. Yep. And Minnesota does push TV. We just, it's just how yeah. it is, right? No one, gets, no one gets ratings like Minnesota. And after that, no one gets ratings like Michigan. And then, and then it falls off pretty fast. So uh, plus up until now, they, they never really had to worry about, you know, getting games on TV because whatever wasn't on Big Ten Network would be carried by Valley here. But mm-hmm. um, as we've discussed before, I believe on this show, um, not an option anymore. It's it's a new world, Viggs. It's going to be about streaming, like we've been saying for a couple of years now. Yeah, I think all sports, you're going to have to hunt around a little bit to find them, whether it's big-time college football or big-time basketball or, or hockey as we know it. It's going to be uh, a challenge to find uh, what channel they're on or what stream they're on and Luckily, Minnesota does a great job having a good production for their TV and streaming broadcasts, and I think that's going to be the future for hockey for at least the near future. A company out of Wisconsin, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, it's right uh, right near, near Madison here. Um, uh, Rush Media that does that, and they do a lot of productions for uh, all, all sorts of sports, basketball, soccer, sure, sure. Um so yeah, they're they're pretty experienced, and yeah, they 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 do it right. I mean, but that's the investment. That's what the school you mm-hmm. know wants to do with it, and thinks it can get enough sponsorship to to make it at least not a huge money loss. Well, being well, part of it is a PR thing, isn't it? It's I mean, think about it. Minnesota has always had the best TV coverage. Um, going back, you know, going back 25, 30 years now, um, and. They're putting money into trying to keep that up as best as they can. And I think that's going to be one of the things for Big Ten schools to promote down the road is, yes, we invest in a great broadcast for your family to watch us, your friends to watch us. And that's part of being on the Big Ten and playing for Minnesota. I think some of these other schools in the league, now that they don't have that Bally support, are going to have to bridge the gap or they're going to be at a disadvantage. And I think that hasn't ever been a problem at Minnesota. They've done everything they can to get as many games on TV as they can. I, you know, even in the Big Ten, there's probably more games on TV than there were back in the old days in the WCHA. 
you know, when you're going out to CC and Denver and Alaska, sometimes those games weren't available for everybody. When they go to Michigan Tech, those games weren't always available. I think people have this, this weird <laughs> hindsight of everything was perfect back then. It was different, and it was nice to have that 7 o'clock window that people could rely on. But it, it wasn't like every game was on TV even back then. But back then, Todd, Alaska Anchorage were the streaming pioneers. They right. were literally way ahead of everybody, even though we had goofy commercials and right. six weeks, six wheel or, or RV little recreational <laughs> things. They were doing a great job back in the 2000s, long before anyone else was thinking about this for free. It's yes to watch, right that that was yes. the, the thing while i was at you know it was gci cable i think right that was if i'm remembering right that was the provider and uh it just happened to, to be that you know they put everything out there for free and which is you know uh, stream many times Corey. Yeah. Yeah, we have seen that <laughs> but yeah that's i mean we've known this is coming it's just you know how fast and and how i mean the i think the one problem that i i i've heard a lot is that how many different subscriptions am i going to have to have that's i mean that's fair and that's you know uh they want you to have to buy as more because yeah. that's how they get get your get your dollar to, to help fund those uh you know billion dollar uh rights deals you know, I think I think Vig's a good compromise on that. Is if you get BTN Plus stream, like you're streaming the hockey package. If there's a game on Big Ten Network that's hockey, you should be able to stream that without having a cable service that has, you know, BTN or you know the Fox Sports app. I think that's a good compromise. Yeah, I think it's going to get more complicated as time goes, and we're Especially just going to have to small. make choices for what we want to watch. Yep, and uh, you know, it's probably cheaper than road trip into all the games and we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, I'm a little surprised by the product that we saw on the ice this last weekend, uh, both for Minnesota and Wisconsin. I, mm -hmm. I thought Minnesota probably got away with a weekend here against Penn state where I don't think they played very well in either game and uh, got pretty lucky. To say the least, Biggs. I, speaking with Cappy after that game, the first thing I said to him Saturday night, Gophers didn't deserve to win that game. They played terrible, and they well, got I thought, lucky. I thought they played terrible the first period on Friday, too. I mean, you watch that first 10 minutes, how many pucks they got deep versus how many they turned over and had to turn around and play defense. It was probably 80% of the pucks were getting turned over on the rush as they came through the neutral zone and went into the Penn state zone. They did not look very clean. I think they anticipated a little bit different weekend than the one Penn state gave them. And it took them a little while to get going. You know, if Sam Renzel doesn't get that gift goal in the first period, it, it could have been an entirely different weekend for Minnesota. And, you know, they would have had to really battle to, to get out of the first round of the big 10. So Minnesota escapes. Wisconsin did not, Todd. Um, what happened? <laughs> How much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> I got to get to that at some point tonight. But um, it, it kind of came down to that. If I, I, I wrote about this, it went back to three weeks earlier when Wisconsin played at Ohio State and you know, Badgers were, you know, looking to move into first place with mm -hmm. Michigan State idle that weekend. Um, could have controlled basically the, the last two weeks of the of the, the race for the championship and um, had a lead late in the Friday night game and let Ohio State get a, a, a long shift in, in the zone. And, and they tied it with a minute and 40 something left. And then one in overtime, and then the next night, they it was just it had flipped over. Uh, Ohio State looked like the better team, mm -hmm. um, and and so taking that in to a playoff series three weeks later, that team coming in on the road isn't isn't afraid of anything. There, there's they've seen the blueprint, they've seen the roadmap to how they come up with an upset. Good goaltending got that. Uh, Getting first goals, got that. Letting letting yourself play 
the style you want to play. And they clog, they clogged the neutral zone once they got a lead. That was like, it looked a little, a little like uh, mid 90s Devils uh, looked like for a <laughs> while there. Uh, score and then lock it down. Um, and, and they got a couple of good bounces. So, um, from the, that's from the Ohio state side, from the Wisconsin side, there just wasn't enough urgency. I mean, all weekend, Mm -hmm. even in the game they won, it felt like they were, they had it for, you know, a 10 minute stretch and then let off the gas. And, and that's, I think that's some of the, the learning, uh, that's still happening with a, a team that, you know, it is half new, you know, from, from last year, but the half that's been back that, that is back hasn't really ever been in that situation before of being a team that's, you know, supposed to win. It's supposed to be one that advances. Um, so learning to play in a, in a pressure situation, that's valuable. And, and I think they will be better off for that eventually, but right now it, it, it you got to feel like the, um, the confidence is, is really shaken there because it's, you know, you're off for two, two weekends, uh, mm-hmm. going into the NCAA tournament. Um, it's, it's, it's tough to, to keep something going through that. Now, you know, maybe you can use it as a reset and like we saw Penn state do last year, um, come out and throw up an eight, nothing game against Michigan tech in the, the first round of the, the NCAAs. But I don't, uh, I don't see this this team having eight goals in them in a game. Uh, so um, it's it's going to be you know these next two weeks are going to be a struggle for them to, um, to to pull it back together for for the NCAA's. And and Vs, I think that's kind of key though for Ohio State. They knew they could handle Wisconsin. They've just played them psychologically. That's that's important. And now they go into Michigan State. Knowing they could beat them as well, Vegas. Or they just beat, right? Yeah, yeah, they just went into Mon and beat them a couple weeks ago. So they they have that confidence right now. They have nothing to lose, and they have a lot to play for. And I look at teams like Minnesota and Wisconsin. Not a lot of guys on these rosters have been in key roles in big games, and I think it's shown by their performances. You know, you look at Wisconsin, they're just not playing with the intensity and the discipline and the connectedness to be successful under a Mike Hastings style. You know, that's not an easy style to play. It's it's a tough style and you have to be engaged and you have to be aware and you have to be on top of pucks and you have to know when to take your chances and when to play the system. And I don't think Wisconsin has a lot of experience doing that other than a couple players who used to play in Mankato. And that shows with the results. Now, the same thing is happening to Minnesota. You know, you look at Jackson Nelson, Aaron Huglin. I thought they had pretty good weekends. Hard to find a lot of other forwards for Minnesota that played well. And I mm-hmm. think some of the defense for Minnesota is still going through that growing pain of learning to play the big heavy minutes and right the ship when things aren't going right. Because I think that takes a little bit of savviness and experience and calmness under pressure to reset your system and talking to Bob Motzko after the series, he was kind of, I think a little gun shy to go after his team too hard because he knows it's a fragile thing to, to have that confidence issue and in, in playing the right way. So it's going to be an intriguing next couple of weeks here for these programs. Yeah, you're interesting. You mentioned that Vicks, because he almost said that, you know, I, I, what, was it you that even asked him, you know, what do you say to the players when you can clearly see what they're doing it wrong. And he kind of gave you the impression like, you know what? I didn't really say much. I kind of let them handle it themselves. He he basically said like, they're saying the right things on the bench. They, they know what to do. Mm-hmm. They're just not executing. And you just can't break out the two by four and kick the trash can because that's <laughs> not going to get the response that you need for them to be successful long-term. And it's, it's a tricky situation. You can't just give maturity and experience to players. That's one of the, the old coaching jokes is you can't buy it at the store. You know, you gotta, you gotta earn it and develop it yourself. So, you know, Friday night Vigs, you know, like you said, they started slow. They did kind of keep, you know, keep it going and get, get a solid win Saturday. We were all kind of sitting there in the entire third period saying, they fell asleep. They're not even, they're just going through the motions or 
we we couldn't even explain it. You know, several of us were there, just kind of, kind of amazed how bad it was. Um, and then they get a lucky puck. Somebody, you know, Hugelin did not trip this guy. He definitely lost his skates. He lost an edge. At least that's how I saw it. And they they did get take advantage of their opportunity and scored to get the game winner. You know, just over a minute left. I was a little surprised there wasn't any kind of call there. You I'm thought he wasn't lost an edge. I, I, I thought he lost. I him. thought there was some contact there, and it creates a scoring chance right off of it. And based, but on he the had the I've puck. Seen... You're allowed contact. You can't trip him. You have the puck. You're allowed contact. He loses an edge. There was no tripping motion. There's no leg out. There's no stick out. Is that my maybe why the ref let it go? Maybe why you let it go, but we've seen Big Ten officiating this year. It's a mystery for us all. <laughs> so it's just kind of surprised that they, they had that and they had the nice chance right off of that opportunity. Great play by Brody Lamb and Aaron Hugland to, to put that one away. But I just felt like Minnesota didn't really have it going. You know, the Snuggerud uh, game DQ earlier oh, was geez. a game-changing play. Um, Motsko had been messy with the lineup throughout the night. You know, he had put Middlestat up with Moore and uh, Pitlick for a while. He had Clark going with them. You know, a lot of changes in the lineup as Bob's trying to find the right recipe with this group. Um, you know, we can talk about checking from behind and when it's a game DQ if you want. I, I'm kind of interested to hear Todd's take on that as the objective person because I kind of feel like we need to almost put together a, a playlist of all the questionable judgment calls this year and just get different perspectives on them. But I thought it was a definite major because he hit him from behind. But you know, when we talk about the game DQ, well, not, not DQ DQ is the plus one. Okay. DQ. The game is conduct. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I did not see this happen live. So I, uh, I don't know the actual, play that happened but um they actually do that they put together the referees at this at their uh preseason event uh for the big 10 and actually this last season it was combined big 10 ccha um they look at a lot of the clips of checking from behind and goalie interference and these things kind of in a row and and try to come to some some consensus what did you see on this who you know, they have a voting thing. So sometimes that ends up 50, 50, you know, 60, 40. Um, and that's, that's the judgment call. So that you, you can, there's some, you know, un, you can understand that to some degree, but um, I, I, I do think there's a, there's a path somewhere. Uh, I don't know what it is to, to getting more, uh, consistent definition to what what we need to be looking for in those situations because it's not necessarily just the the the, the severity or the the degree of violence or you know the whether an injury results out of it that those are those are hard to even on replay to to quantify as a this is a, you know uh, from a, a one to a five you know where does it fall on that you know people people are going to disagree on that. Um, space from the the boards that's that's a factor um whether the player did anything to turn into the hit that's a factor um i mean i'm i'm racking my brain for what what they've kind of go, what they go over but um yeah i I don't know. There's not a great answer. I, honestly, that's it. There's it's not true. a great that's answer. That's just it. You could talk, talk in circles here and come around and you haven't gone anywhere. So um, <laughs> it, it's it's a really, it is a case by case thing. And and that's, that's the unfortunate part about it. Well, when we heard Steve Piotrowski on the show podcast earlier this year, he said when they show these clips, very rarely would there ever be a unanimous consensus. Yeah. What the call should be. And I think that just, it's, it's tough for college hockey fans to watch these games and see players get kicked out for things that might not even be penalties in the NHL. Yeah. Which is why they, 
you know, they changed the rule a couple of years ago so that it was, uh, you know, all these things weren't necessarily automatic. The game misconduct that you can give them the five without the game, uh, which was seen as a, you know, kind of a middle ground of, yeah, we think this is bad enough to be a major, but not bad enough to take you out of the game. And I, I feel like I, we've seen that, but maybe not as much as I thought we would. Um, you know, I, I thought refs would maybe give players a benefit of the doubt uh, in some of those situations, but um, it, it, it hasn't, I haven't seen any data on it or anything like that, but I don't, I don't think it's happened as much as I, as I went into it thinking it was going to. So Viggs, obviously they could talk to their partner when they're reviewing, they kind of, come together as a team and decide what they're going to do. Can they talk to an off ice official or are they only allowed to, you know, get video instructions from them? Cause usually there's another off ice official in the arena, kind of monitoring, you know, everything from video to kind of just keeping an eye on things. Like even last weekend, you know, all the arenas had to have one extra referee and one extra linesman in case somebody, was injured. So there was more people there. Are they allowed to talk to those guys during these reviews? From what I can tell, the off ice official is just presenting the information to them and helping them okay. see the clips. Okay. And I think the only way they can talk to them is by showing a clip over and over again to say, Hey, you should be looking at this a little closer. Mm. This is what I'm seeing. I can't <laughs> tell you anything, but I can show you rather than tell you. But I, I just wish there was more consistency there. I don't think there's the infrastructure in college hockey to have like a that is you know, go let's go to Toronto or New York or whatever it is in the NHL when they have an official there is in the Big Ten. I mean they they very well could do that, but that's not in the protocols for as as far as I understand that to, to do that just in one conference as opposed to you know having a, a nationwide kind of thing like like you're talking about there, yeah. Yeah, Pat McLennie cornered me up in the press box after the period because I <laughs> didn't think it should have been an ejection for Snuggerud. I thought it was just a major because the player turns and puts himself in a vulnerable position the last couple of minutes, and his head isn't going straight into the boards. It's kind of a shoulder turn, and that's why I think it shouldn't have been the game misconduct. I thought I five-minute major, but keep the player in the game because I think that's the way the rule was rewritten is to keep players in the game because it can be such a game-changing decision when you have a Hobie Baker candidate who's gone after, what, four minutes? <laughs> it it kind of – He got an assist. <laughs> he got his point. That's true. <laughs> it, it's it, – and it's just, you know, the game has become more and more important. Um, you know what? Don't put yourself in that position, Snuggerud. He knows better, Viggs. He does. He does. And you could tell he kind of knew it afterwards. Yep. He was like, yeah, shouldn't have done that. And then I think Motsko compounded it by trying to get the review on the fish head, which I didn't think was going to be a penalty. Your glasses have to be very maroon tinted to think that that was going to be called uh, a major and a misconduct mm -hmm. in turn. What do you do? What do you do? It's just kind of how everything just rolls out. And, you know, I, I thought the rest of the refing that weekend was pretty good, Beegs. Um, You guys had Sean Fernandez over there, Todd. And he is known for not calling a lot of penalties. Um, A lot of people don't say, oh, he's a terrible ref. Well, I know, Beegs, you said to me, no, he just doesn't call a lot. He just lets a lot go. Yeah. Uh, how did that crew do in Madison this past weekend? There was a lot of that in the, in stretches, you know, in, in Sunday's game, uh, Wisconsin didn't get a power play and that's, you know, the first time in Sean Fernandez. a long time. Uh, <laughs> He's that, one of the routes. There's, there's two of them. So, right. Right. Uh, they were going to get a power play, but, uh, they called an embellishment on the same call. Uh, uh, actually, I remember, called, remember you explaining that one of your right. you, the Facebook videos. Yes. It was announced as diving, which, it can't be diving if you're also calling the original penalty. That's that's those, those don't add up. Um, you think that was just a little miscommunication? Or? I think it was. Uh, yeah, he just said the wrong thing, and they yeah. got it right on the box score. They called it embellishment. Okay, um, okay. It 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 just is was a. And Mike Hastings said it after 
after the game, he said, I found it curious that um, our guy who was about to go in on a breakaway would try to dive because it was a block shot that bl- it blocked out in the neutral zone. The defender, the Wisconsin player, had the speed against the Ohio State player who got in his way. And, uh, yeah, I think he did kind of make some dramatics about it, you know, kind of, you know, did the arms flailing a little bit as he went to the oh. ice. <laughs> kind of um, reminds me of an overtime call in St. Cloud in Minnesota a couple of years back. But oh. I digress. <laughs> um, but. I don't know. It, it, you know, in those split seconds there, um, hard to say whether that's going to be a breakaway, how, how much speed he has, uh, whether he thinks he's actually going to be able to, to do something at the end of the breakaway or if uh, um, trying to where he's at, where he's at in his shift. Is yeah. Right. Early in the shift versus late in the shift. Like he's, uh, I'm dead tired. I'm going to try to draw a penalty instead yeah. of trying to break away. So a lot of those factors in there and um, just called them both and, and uh, played four and four. Honestly, it for the Badgers this weekend, it probably wasn't the repping. It was just the lack of offense, especially no. Sunday. They, I mean, yeah, it's, it, I can see you getting surprised Friday. Oh, I mean, you come back Saturday pretty strong. Sunday, it, there just wasn't anything there. Yeah, the fire that that I think they wanted to see just didn't, um, you know, didn't show up fast enough. Um, and, and then you're playing from behind, uh, and then uh, you get you get a bad bounce and you're down by two. And then, then it's really tough as you're going in the third period down by two. Uh, they, they did sort of pull something together for, for a good stretch. Um, but Logan Turnus when was a, was a really good goalie in both of those wins. And, and that was the thing about the way they staggered that series, you know, because they've been rotating goalies. They went with one goalie in game one, one goalie, a different goalie in game two. You have a fresh goalie in game three um, that you go back to. Um, that's that's one of those things about when you're in a rotation, you can get away with that and 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 still have both of them feeling confident. Like, hey, I did, you know, I got I got my start, I did my job, I did, you know, I contributed. But mm-hmm. um, then when you have to go to a, 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 a deciding game, you can. You can turn to one of them and say, hey, you're our guy here, so go make it happen. Well, strange things happen, so. But we need to get into this coming weekend coming up. But first, we need to hear from our sponsors. Jake Middleton here, Director of Hair and Hygiene for the Minnesota Wild. How did I get this important role with the team, you ask? I'd like to think it was because of hard work, but the truth is, I run hot. Yep, I'm a sweater. In my role as Director of Hair and Hygiene, I'm sort of like a player coach. Let me pull out the grease board here. Well, it's not actually a grease board, because there is nothing dirty about Duke Cannon. How do I help the guys stay squeaky clean? Helpful reminders. It's simple. Tarp saw, Duke Cannon on. Say it with me. Tarp saw, Duke Cannon on. Tarp saw, Duke Cannon on. Pick the scent that suits you. Sawtooth. Thick body wash, extra thick. And my favorite, Midnight Swim. Tarp saw, Duke Cannon on. Duke Cannon, work harder, smell better. We thank Duke Cannon for sponsoring the GPL podcast. We know they're our big sponsor for the hockey hair for uh, Mr. King over at Pull Tab Sports this weekend. And hopefully if anyone gets a chance to see that, if you haven't, I'm guessing everyone has, Viggs. A lot of bleached hair this year, which I don't know if I'm on board with in the mm-hmm. state tournament. I get the team bonding thing, but a lot of people went to that well this year for yeah. the hockey hair. But the video, as always, entertaining. I got uh, friends in flow places. Check it out. <laughs> it was definitely good. But we also need to talk about Cub, and I was I tweeted out earlier this week. I had my donut holes from Cub, Viggs, and uh, they're already gone. <laughs> Well, Cubs all aboard the Pull Tab Sports Wagon. They sponsor the Wild and Southern Pod, sponsor Twins Homer Hankies. They're on PJ Flex headset. They're one of us, and they support the GPL podcast too. Visit your local Cub. They're all over for your food and beverage needs, pickup or delivery. They got you at Cub.com. 
everything's always in stock. The milk is very fresh. You know, the probably one pretty close to your house. Check them out. Cub. Definitely check out Cub Foods. All right, let's bring Todd back in and talk about this weekend. As right as I was looking here, great thing from Sloth. Sparty is one and three against Ohio State, with them going two and one in Wisconsin. Do you think they have a chance to take down Sparty? Viggs, I think Ohio State has a chance to get into the tournament if they keep playing well. And wouldn't that just mess up the whole pairwise and all the lower end of the pairwise if they were to sneak in? Because that would mean five teams from the Big Ten. Maybe. Could <laughs> could be just four still, depending on how things go. But I think Ohio State's much better than their record indicates. You know, they've got a lot of guys who transferred in to try to, you know, get some experience for Ohio State who lost a lot last year. I don't think things came together as much as Steve Rollock would have liked. You know, he mm-hmm. traditionally has a very strong system that guys kind of learn over time and trying to force feed that to this team did not go well. He's got a couple guys who are a little undisciplined with Bricky and Halliday, but they're talented. And so when those guys are going well and they have momentum in, in games, they can be a dangerous team to play against. And, and Rolex is a good coach. You know, he, he didn't just come out of high school. He, he's been doing this for a while, and he's going to give them a, a tough matchup here this week. And, Todd, we know both Minnesota and Michigan are rooting for Ohio State because if Ohio State gets the upset, whoever wins the Minnesota-Michigan game gets to host the Big Ten Championship. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, the thing that I think Ohio State can use, uh, again, like we are talking about before, two things. Uh, one of them being the the belief that, hey, we did this already. We we went in there and we, we beat Michigan State. Um, and not like Michigan State wasn't playing for anything. They were, you know, trying to – lock up a conference championship and, you know, further things that way. Um, so there's that part of it, but there's also, I mean, looking back at last week and I thought, you know, some of their best players were their best players and that's great mm-hmm. for, for a team in the playoffs. Uh, you mentioned Halliday and, and Bricky. I thought they were really good last week at both of them. Uh, Davis Bernstein was really good. Uh, the, the goalies, uh, you know, like I talked about Logan Turnus, uh, played great and and now you're in a one game weekend so you can you can go to him and say look you know you know we know we normally split but you you get the first one and so you're getting the first one so um i i think that that puts them in a good spot but you're still talking about a michigan state team that's there for a reason um mm-hmm. i was talking with someone today about you know the the advantage disadvantage of the uh, of winning the, the championship and having the week off um, that you have to, you know, kind of keep it together and keep it at, at a, a high level for uh, through a week, a weekend without games. And that um, we've seen, the, you know, where that's been okay. And we've seen where that hasn't been great in the big 10 in the last, you know, four or five years. Um, and so that, you know, that's a little bit, of an, a little bit of an unknown there because, you know, with, with uh, uh, you know a, a team that that hasn't gone through this before, and you know some some players have you know been on other teams that you know maybe have had other chances at success, uh, but we don't know really what we're going to see out of Michigan State here because we haven't seen them in this position yet, and so that's that's where the intrigue for me comes in uh, of of seeing where this uh, where this goes this week. I think they you would say they're a fairly big favorite, but you know. After seeing what Ohio State did last weekend, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, you know, say no. They they've got no chance here because I I think they they honestly do. He definitely got the confidence, Viggs. Well, Ohio State's got the confidence, and in, in Michigan State, you know, when I was looking at some of the, the the voting for the conference awards, it's hard to know who from Michigan State really stirs the drink there. You know, they've had a great season. Their, their freshman defenseman, uh, Lashuvnov, has been Lefshov, great. Yeah. Levishnov, I'll work on it. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the reminder. I, I've been working on it all season. I still don't know if I have it right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he's he's been great. Uh, they've got some players like Howard uh, up front who flash, and, and they've had good goaltending, but I just don't know how high-end this team is. They've they've done very well this season and, and won the league and are the number one seed for a reason. 
but I just don't think they're a dominant number one seed, which makes this weekend very scary. And Bob Motzko today was even talking about how, you know, back when they were the number one seed, they've done all kinds of things. They did like an inner squad scrimmage. They went down to Austin one year to, for like a public scrimmage. You know, they've tried rest, you know, lots of different things to try to figure out what to do with this bye week. And I think Michigan State is, is going to have to figure this all out for the first time. And they're going to be playing against a team that's confident. So I, you know, I haven't looked at the money line for this, but I bet there's value there on the Buckeyes. Time to get rid of the format, Todd. Well, in exchange for what? I guess that's I the. Mean, I mean, think about it. we had we had a, t- a team. In fact, we had you know, more than one team that had a buy at times. You know, in the WCHA Final Five. Um, but you know, I mean, they could they could go back to that type of format. I, I'm yeah. I, I'm sure Bob would like it extend the season a little more. So there's you know, everybody's playing, but. You get into some of the same discussions with that as you do with the regionals. Yeah, you know, who can host and you know if you if you go to a, a one weekend, two weekend, what whatever you want to do, it 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 has the same scheduling issues with a couple mm-hmm. of schools like the one that I cover, um, <laughs> not, not having their own building for some of the days, and um, it, you're you're just kind of changing one pro one problem for another in some of those things. But I, I, one of the big concerns I think for a lot of teams is so the, the having the final weekend of the regular season off is rotated through everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wisconsin gets it next year. And so if you're thinking ahead and if they're, at, you know, even if they're in a position, you know, in a race for the championship, yes. they could, if they win the regular season, they could potentially have two weekends off going into the big 10 semifinal. If they lose that, then another weekend off going into the NCAA tournament. That's a that's a terrible way to, to be ready. Playing for once the, in a month, it's like, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's I I don't you know I I think there's an answer there somewhere in the fact that the Big Ten is going to have seven teams, CCHA is going to have nine, NCHC is going to have nine. So there there should be some. And I I may be wrong in those numbers, by the way. I, I'm just pulling that off the top of my head, but. Um, there may be some matchups you can you could make there between you know the Big Ten's always going to have a team off on the last weekend. These other leagues are always going to have a team off on the last weekend. Make something happen. Um, of course, mm-hmm. that requires leaving open a non-conference weekend space and who gets it at home. And it's uh, again more problems being caused by trying to solve one problem. Yes. Um, but yeah, there's. Uh, there are issues uh, all the way down the line there. Yet another situation in college hockey where teams might be doing something for their own self-interest that could come back to bite them someday. And once again, a situation where following the categorical imperative, what's best for everybody is a smart decision-making. And I just don't know if we're going to get there. You know, we've talked about, you know, Different schools in the Big Ten may be bidding to host. I don't think anyone really has a lot of appetite for that to go to Notre Dame or go to Minnesota or go to Yost for the a weekend of semis and a final. The atmospheres could be bad yeah. for a semi with visiting teams. The home team loses in the first round. Now your championship game doesn't have much atmosphere. And I just don't think big buildings like Excel and uh, Little Caesars work right yeah. now for the Big Ten. Well, and look at what we've seen the last two years. I mean, everyone loved – the atmosphere of the championship weekend, right? Uh, or the championship night. Uh, and, and even going back into the semifinals, I remember those being pretty, uh, you know, the buildings being pretty live uh, in, yeah. in those nights. And so that's what I think was attractive to to the Big Ten saying, hey, this, this seems to be working. Um, now you... you to get to that, you have to then sacrifice that, you know, first weekend and being having it be a little, okay, well, forget about that. But hey, look at what we've got coming here. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know that you can solve all of that. Um, but I think if they have a strong championship weekend, if they can have a, a, a strong-ish uh, semifinal weekend, those are good signs for 
um, you know, how they can market it, I guess, if, if you're looking at it from that perspective. Well, Wisconsin said all the tenants records last weekend because of that big arena they got. Right. And the, the fact that the games are on the season ticket package. So that's your, you know, couple thousand base every night. So, um, they knock ticket prices down to 15 bucks from 24, 20, whatever it is. Um, yeah, the Sunday wasn't great. Uh, they announced yeah. 70, 700, something like that. Um, but they also didn't sell that until after Saturday's game was over for single tickets. Um, but yeah, um, quarterfinals have just always been. Let's get these games played and move on into into where we can uh, get some excitement rolling here. Well, I think we should probably move to where the quarterfinal games are taken with that mindset. Mm-hmm. Let's just get them played so we can move on to the main course of the semis and the final, and really focus your planning on campus sites and selling as many tickets for those two games as you those three games as you can. Yeah. So then the question is, do you just cut it off at four teams? I mean, that's not the way that anything's really ever gone. I mean, I, I know some of the, the 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 I think Hockey East at one point, I don't know if they I don't think they do it anymore because they have a first round, but they cut theirs off at eight, I think, at one point. Uh when yes, I think you're right. Um and I <laughs> <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um I mean we lose the Ohio State storyline this year if we do that, but it makes right. a lot of sense to me. You, but you're putting a lot more emphasis than on the regular season, right? As being true as important, you know, because everyone says it's the hardest championship to win, and that's great. But if if it means two weeks later you're 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 done mm-hmm. with the playoffs, I, what did it get you really? It may it, Got you a, a trophy and a, and a and a ring and and a, maybe a banner, uh, but I, I don't I don't know how you how you grade that in in the big picture. The other thing I would think of is maybe there's a play in game, right? You know, you have, you have a play in game on like a Wednesday, and then you have your round. So maybe just one team gets you know skipped over. Yeah, so. I mean those have been pretty popular in the, you know, thinking about the, the NBA format that they tried, you know, uh, but that was when, you know, moving it from whatever eight teams qualified per conference and expanding it to 10, that was creating more excitement and more markets out of that. We, we're, we're kind of talking about going the other way on this here and, and taking some out. But um, I, I think if you, if you put something on the line there like that, that, uh, you know, as a one game shot to, to get into the semis, yeah, that could, that could be a, a pretty decent way of doing it. Just take a look at the Big Ten women's or men's brackets for their tournaments. It basketball. is crazy for basketball. Yeah. And you're going to add four more teams next year. What's that bracket going to look like? I mean, there are things you can do. You might have to get creative. You might have to actually add another team. Or kick Notre Dame out. <laughs> I don't know that I don't know that that helps. I don't know if we gotta go that far too, but I don't know. I we don't I, need to throw the baby and the bathwater out, Jupe. We can we can keep Notre Dame around. <laughs> oh, oh Golden Gopher oh. says the bottom four teams don't make the Big Ten tournament next mm. year. I wonder if that's true. Mm. But they still have a goofy bracket then. Yeah. Uh I was I was uh working on something with the, the women's hockey tournament. And of course that's 11 teams and, you know, yep. trying to explain how an 11 team bracket looks is, is not easy because, you know, people like even numbers and those kind of things. Oh it's, gosh, it's yes. easier to digest. So if you got 11, um, I mean, when you, when you look at it on a bracket, it, it kind of makes sense, but uh, trying to explain it doesn't. It's oh, we've seen that in Minnesota high school hockey a lot of mm-hmm. times. Sections will do weird things because those one versus eleven games would never be very competitive yeah. anyway. So why right. why give that chance? Yeah, you're just trying to give away for a team to end their season somewhat respectably. I think in these formats. Well, all right, Vegs. Before we get into Minnesota, Michigan this weekend, we need to talk about Will Anderson Insurance. And I noticed Will did get a nice little pub 
in the hockey hair video, and he had some hockey hair, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's a pull tab sports guy, so why not give a little bit more hair to that kind of thinning uh, salad that he's got there? Put a little reinforcements there, maybe a little butter, lettuce, romaine, you know, thicken it up. Yeah. And uh, that'll give you something to think about when you close your eyes and think of your insurance agent. And, uh, you know, you want to ask yourself, are they saving you money? Will they answer your call? Will, will. Reach out to him. He'll insure you the same way as his own family. He'll explain it to you so it makes sense. You know, we've often talked about we need Will Anderson to explain officiating in the Big Ten. And we can't promise he'll save you money. Let's just say you should sure get a quote. Call 612-361-7283 or visit willandersonagency.com. And, of course, we cannot forget about the Yoakum Real Estate Group. Yeah, maybe I think after the state high school hockey tournament is maybe a good time to start selling your house. You know, it's Super Bowl Sunday is big, but maybe it's the high school hockey tournament. And it's an official trigger point to list your home and start looking. If you're thinking of going into the market, don't roll the dice on your biggest asset. Think twice and contact the twins, Sarah and Jody at Yoakum Real Estate. If they stand side by side, their wingspan is bigger than that other guy who buys too many billboards. Visit YoakumRealEstateGroup.com for more info. And of course, we thank Will Anderson and Yoakum Realty for sponsoring the GPL podcast. Let's bring Todd back into here. Minnesota and Michigan Viggs. Um, obviously, we had Todd on this week, so we really thought we were going to Madison. And uh, that didn't happen. But I'm like, Todd, you got to come on with us anyway because your, your wide knowledge of all things college hockey. So I'm glad you stayed with us. Thank you. And he's got Cappy clipping at his heels now. So he's got to you know, get <laughs> He awesome does have Cappy up. clipping on his heels. Bump those numbers up. <laughs> right. <laughs> can't, can't turn down a chance anymore, right? Minnesota, Michigan, Viggs. Um Kind of a three-peat, you know, it's not the championship game, but it's uh, either teams are going to go home and get an extra week off, I'll tell you that. Well, it should be an entertaining game. You know, they've already sold, I think, eight, 9,000 tickets for this one, so there should be great atmosphere. Michigan's talented. Like, I love watching them play. You know, every time I get to see Gavin Brindley, uh, mm-hmm. Rucker McGordy, uh, Seamus Casey, you know, I come away impressed with their game. It's just consistency with the Wolverines. You never know what you're going to get. They can take penalties. They can play undisciplined. Uh, so we'll see what they give Minnesota. What do you think, Todd? I mean, your team's not in it anymore, but I know you got a lot of interest in this stuff. So I'm, I, I'm always fascinated by, like Viggs is saying, watching Michigan play because um, I don't know that there's a more enjoyable or more frustrating team to watch. It's <laughs> so true. Because it, the enjoyable part is obvious. It's, you know, when they, mm-hmm. when the talent gets rolling and, and everything starts clicking, it, 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 it is fun to watch that team play. But it's because of that, that when it gets sloppy and when they don't want to back check and when they hang their goalie out to dry, that they get into these games where it's like they 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 have no reason losing this game but they're going to do it anyway um and, and so those um it, it's it's been a little bit of a roller coaster in in that for them this season and that's why they're in that you know 10 11 12 range in the pairwise instead of in the the top 4 or 5 um so from from that perspective uh, i think they're one of the hardest teams to to figure out which one you're going to get. Like I I I feel like they they should they should go in there and you know put up four or five goals this week. Uh, and I don't, but I don't know whether they'll give up five or six. So um, that's the mystery to me. Of uh, it, it's not so much on the Minnesota side. I think Minnesota, even though it's um, there's been some. Sp- spots here and there and like last week it you know there were some really questionable spots of you know is is the intensity here of what mm-hmm. we want it to be in the playoffs um i i feel like you do know a little bit more predictably what you're gonna see from them game to game um now it would be really nice for them if snuggerud gets going a little bit more and uh yes. Keeps himself in games, obviously, being important. Um, 
so I, 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 I honestly feel like this is one. So Michigan's come in there two years in a row and won in the playoffs. I, I think this is one. Minnesota has home ice advantage, and it actually means something. Because we have talked kind of similarly about Michigan these past three seasons. They had because there are times where they could they could have easily won the national championship the last two seasons. They had the skill, uh, but comes back to what you've said this last couple seasons. Yeah, they could be on, but then they just they're just not disciplined, or they're just something they've done to mess the thing up. But there's all the tools there for them to be very successful again. I think one stat really encompasses what Michigan hockey is. You look at their power play. It's like 36%. Yes. Number one in the country by a long shot, by like eight or nine percentage points. The talent they can put out on their first power play unit is immense, and they're really good at it. And then you look at their penalty kill, 78%, 44th in the country. Now, some of that's goaltending, but a lot of that's discipline and structure, both in putting your team shorthanded and being disciplined enough to take away seam passes that will kill your goalie. And that's been the problem with Michigan. And when they play Minnesota in these Big Ten championship games, they have not taken very many penalties. That is true, yeah. And they've gone on the power play. And they've taken advantage of that and played very well. Who knows what kind of game we'll get this weekend. You almost kind of hope, uh, if you're a Minnesota fan, that Sean Fernandez is holding the whistle and there's no penalties <laughs> called and it's just five-on-five five hockey. But who knows what's going to happen. It's a big test for Minnesota. The one thing I think Minnesota has right now that's really going to help them is Justin Close has played very well. You know, Against Penn State on Saturday, I think they had nearly 100 shot attempts. And close look very steady. That's a big key for Minnesota this weekend is they have a goalie they can count on. They just got to take away those passes that go across the slot. If they can Mm -hmm. let closer see the puck, he's going to be pretty reliable this weekend. So that's a big question. Um, The last time Michigan was in town, Viggs, um, Minnesota did score five goals in a period. That, That was a really goofy game for one thing. Michigan did pull it out in overtime. We talked about all that stuff there, but it kind of lends to what you're saying. They can be very undisciplined on the, you know, taking penalties and whatnot. But when the stakes are are higher, they have been more disciplined, like you said. So I don't know where to go with this whole game this weekend. I just, you just don't know. We have no idea what's going to happen. The other big key, I think, for Minnesota is they need Snuggerud and Moore and Pitlick to be engaged. We talked about this last week on the podcast. They are roller coasters of emotions, and everybody knows it. Mm-hmm. And I think Michigan's going to know that coming into this weekend. You know, They're going to pick at them and say, hey, where are you at? Because they want to compete. Will and they so be Minnesota, together? They might not even be together. Uh, you know, I think Moscow's trying to figure out what to do with that line what to do with Brodzinski, you know, Jimmy Clark has had a very good season. Do you elevate him in situations? John Middlestat seemed to earn some trust where he gets elevated for energy throughout the game. Nelson had seven goals in four games. <laughs> Nelson's doing very well right now. There's, so right there. <laughs> he's hot. Uh, and he looks like he's very engaged. You know, he's, he's mm-hmm. doing all the things that the coaching staff wants. He's kind of a quiet kid but he's doing the things on the ice that you have to do at this time of year. He just needs a little bit more help and a little bit more evenness from his teammates. So what is your prediction, Todd, on both semifinals this coming weekend? Let's start with Michigan State and Ohio State. Can OSU get the upset? Can, absolutely. Will they? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say Michigan State comes out uh, a 3-1 game. Okay. Minnesota, Michigan. Ooh, take the over. Um, <laughs> I'm, are you hoping a comet hits <laughs> like many of the Badger fans probably want? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I think people around here wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, be 
too terribly upset there, but um, I'm going to say five, four gophers. I'm going to say um, that's going to be decided late. I love those big scoring games with Michigan. And I mean, yes, Minnesota did lose that six to five game Viggs, but that was quite the entertaining third period, man. That was fun. It was very entertaining hockey, and I think that's what you have to hope for with with yes. Minnesota and Michigan. I was just going to try to look up the over under for this game. It's seven over, which is a, which is a big <laughs> number. Hammer, where's the hammer? Hammer the <laughs> over. Hammer the over. <laughs> Seven's aggressive because I honestly think with Justin Close, if he can see the puck. It's going to be tough for a high scoring game if Minnesota's engaged because Minnesota has shown, like when they beat Penn State 3 0, 3 0, and they were in that stretch, they were playing connected hockey. Mm -hmm. When they do that, it's a low scoring game. Mm -hmm. Did this Penn State weekend get their attention enough where they start playing that style? Because I thought they were. You know, when they were going through that stretch, we were seeing Minnesota play tight hockey, not taking chances, not chasing, being on top of pucks. That's what they have to do if they're going to be mm -hmm. successful. If they get into a shootout where it's like 6'5", five, 5'4", five, Minnesota's going to have a very short run here in the postseason. You can't play that way with this team. They can't outscore their mistakes. I think Minnesota wins their game 3-2, maybe 4-2 with an empty netter. I think the under is a good good call here. Um, now, with Michigan State, Ohio State, I feel like this plus 260 for Ohio State is juicy. Yeah. That's some good value. I, I would definitely take that if I was a gambling man, which I'm not this weekend. But uh I like <laughs> I like weekend. the Buckeyes. Yeah, I like the Buckeyes here. And I think they have a chance to win it outright. Really? I like your thoughts. I'm picking the Buckeyes as well. I like that they played last week and they played three games last weekend. Get a little extra time off this week. Go into Mun. You know they have they haven't played. And it'll be about two weeks since Michigan State's played, and they take advantage and get the win. Minnesota, Michigan, boy, I'm going with Minnesota. I, I I'm more with Todd. I think it is going to be a higher scoring game, which I'd love to see. It's very entertaining. So that's what I'm going to go with. Boy, but I wouldn't be surprised if I wouldn't be surprised if Michigan State's hosting Michigan next weekend. So I also will not be surprised to see the Gophers shorten their bench this weekend a little bit against Michigan. It's one game. It's going to be a high skill game, a lot of offense. I think maybe we see, you know, Bob kind of roll almost like ten forwards a little bit more than we've seen him do, and I think we see. You know, they like have the top 4D play heavier minutes uh, throughout the weekend. So look for that. Okay. Okay. And Todd, I'm guessing you're going to be working a lot of the Wisconsin women's games this weekend and, and, and the game before it to whoever they're going to play. Correct. Yeah. Uh, a little bit different. We haven't, it's, it's strange. There hasn't been a, a NCAA women's game here since 2019, which is just crazy to think about. I mean, they've been, you know, they had them so many years in a row up till then. Yeah. And then, you know, the 20 tournament gets canceled. 21's play, all played in Erie. 22 and 23, they're the sixth seed in both of those tournaments. Um, and so they go go on the road. Um, but, yeah, they're they're back here. They, they uh, Thursday night game is St. Lawrence and Penn State, and the winner gets Wisconsin on Saturday afternoon. So should be fun. Um, you know, not – I'm not really sure what to what to expect out of St. Lawrence, Penn State, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm intrigued on that one, uh, but it's going to be tough for either one of those teams to to beat a Wisconsin team if they're playing like yeah what we saw last weekend against the Gophers and Ohio State, even though they needed kind of a miracle to uh, to get past the Gophers in the first round or in the semifinals. Yeah, I happened to catch that end of that game, and uh, it was great. You know, Miss had a great chance down low, and literally a minute later, it literally she just turned around and just threw it on that, and it just caught her surprised. You know that would have like, been that would have been Brad Frost's five hundredth win. Really, to do it against the go against the Badgers in the semis, <laughs> and they he'll have to do it against Clarkson, I guess. Yank that one. 
Yeah, that's a uh, that's, that's a, a that's a good game. matchup. Yeah, yeah, it could be. I mean, Clarkson's really strong uh, uh, in goal on defense. Um, throw Abby Murphy against that and see what happens <laughs> because I mean, she's going to get something. It feels like uh, almost every game. I, she might be angry because she's not on any awards. She's like second team this, second yeah. team that, and this will have to be an overtime topic. The Abby Murphy controversy. Oh, I'm with you on that one. Oh, that's a good tease there. Yeah, I like Viggs. that, Viggs. Doing this a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming on, Todd. Even though your Badgers didn't make it, you are more than welcome on the show at any time. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll I'll drop in. No, somebody. I'll just I'll just show up. Just, you know, you thought about it a couple times you know, last year when you were covering some basketball. I could have. I, I needed you're watching. And I needed it last year when I was covering basketball. That, that yeah, if, if you're ever watching and you see you got something, just send me a text or something. I'll get you right on anytime just to get Cappy going too. If awesome. Cappy's on, if Cappy's on, he's like, oh, I'm catching up. We'll just bring you on just, just for fun. <laughs> just to get him going. Right. <laughs> well, definitely thanks for being on the show. And that's going to do it for this GPL podcast. We'll be back next week when our guest is Nick Angel. I think you all know who he is. He's got a lot of recruiting and uh, stories of uh, Chia and Gensel. It's going to be quite fun. For those of you watching live, stay tuned for overtime. For the rest of you, we'll catch you next week on the GPL Podcast. tonight Viggs. this is from founders with the gophers playing a michigan team i thought i'd go into the michigan territory here this is called barrel runner it's a mosaic hopped ale aged in rum barrels 11.1 percent 2018 release from the rob shield seller the rob of the week seller. very nice Viggs. very nice i also gotta put on my uh Oh yeah, let's glasses. see those. Let's see them. You got some new spectacles today. I got my, uh, are my those Brock prescriptions? Favors. These are the wind down ones. So oh, here's wind down. So you got some prescription ones though, didn't you? Just from Huxley. Get the nice Faber case. And if you are at the Gopher game uh, this weekend, I've got uh, a glasses case to give away. We have one more Unreal sweatshirt to give away. So if you're at if you're at the game Saturday, stay tuned to GPL for some tweets. And maybe you can find it and get some swag from us. Cheers. And you were very popular, you know. They you had some nice sweatshirts. Last week, those pull tab ones. Oh, very nice. This I need is to a non-branded one, one. Yeah. I need to get me one of those. Yep. Yeah, Abby Murphy just making everybody upset in uh the WCHA. I mean, she's <laughs> the she is the 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 definition of that player that you want on your team, but hate when she isn't like, and it's so true. Everyone says that about her. It's that's it. I mean, if she can get under someone's skin as much as she does, and I don't really see her against Wisconsin players, but if, if she can get under their skin that much, <laughs> that's, and that has some value to it. I mean, even if it, um, you know, you have to kind of not care about a reputation, but if you're all right with that, a lot of it works. I mean, I, it, there's there's something to be said for, you know, uh, well, she doesn't need to do this. She doesn't need to do that. Yeah, maybe not, but that's the way she plays, and it seems like it it works pretty well. So um, I, I, I go back and forth on, on this whole thing of, you know, what's is it a respect thing is it a you know we you know other coaches don't like the antics um i don't know hard to hard to dispute the numbers though 
it seems to like fuel her game too. Mm-hmm. You know, I I don't watch every game, but I I watched a little bit here and there, especially down the stretch. And it's like she feeds off of it. It's kind of like that Marshawn kind of like when she's chirping, like she's energized and she's playing well. It's not like a distraction. You know, some players, they start running their mouth, they start getting chippy. It takes away from what they do well. It's almost like it adds to it for her. I don't know. I think Marshawn's worse. I just want to punch him no matter what. If you were a Bruins fan, you'd love it, though. I, like all the Bruins fans love his antics. Mm-hmm. I I wouldn't want him on my team, but I've said that publicly. I'm like I'm just not a big fan of it. But they're kind of different me. players. But that's just me. She's kind of like the the college the women's Taychuk, maybe. I don't know. And he got Florida to the Stanley Cup Finals. So yeah. And then he fell apart a little bit, but. Snuggerood. He needs to start contributing these. I'm just gonna say it. It's um and I know he's he's had some you know wrist injuries, arm injury, whatever, upper body. I don't know what's going on with him. But if this team wants to win a national championship, both he and Pitlick need to be A plus the rest of the way. Well, Todd was saying, you know, when Ohio State's going, it's because they got Bricky and Halliday going. If Minnesota's going to make a run, Snuggerud has to figure this out, and it can't be this down stuff, like this body language of, oh, I'm not scoring. Every time you miss, you look up to the sky. No, it's like keep playing and look for the next chance. You know, that's part of the stuff that made Matthew Nyes and Brock Faber so good. They didn't spend any time having pity parties for themselves on the ice. You know, they played hard and looked for the next opportunity to get it back. And sometimes I see this stuff, the body language, mm-hmm. it's so revealing in these guys. And you just kind of wonder, is he really all in right now? You know, he says all that stuff that he, he says he's the right guy and he wants to be back and he wants to be in, but you got to see it on the ice. And it's it's not there right now. And I, I think it's a little frustrating for the fans and, and maybe even for his coach to figure out because it's it's delicate. You know, if you push too hard, maybe you lose them. I don't know. I just now with some Wisconsin players over the years where they the body language just takes over and the whole team feels that and vibes that and yeah, really has a hard time calling out their star to get, get it back in line, too. It's one thing when it's a, a young guy. Uh, versus a, a third or fourth year guy, you see that coming from those guys, and and then you're like, well, this is kind of ingrained now. This is this is the way the team is. Um... <laughs> I, I I don't know, um, but because he's what nineteen, Snuggerud. Yeah, I mean he's only a sophomore, and yeah. He- uh, he didn't take the long way. He took the short way. You know, two years in Ann Arbor and right here. It's, you know, everyone grows up and everyone, you know, finds their, you know, the pro mentality at, at a different rate. Um, and it, I don't know, Some sometimes it, it, you know, there's there's like an aha moment of like, you know, someone takes you aside and says this, you know, if, if you're going to be a pro, you can't do this, this, this. And sometimes you don't feel like you have, no one feels like they have the ability to say something like that because they don't know how someone's, that person's going to react. And I wonder where everyone's at in, in that. Um, I, I have, I, I don't know anyone well enough there to know um, whether anyone can have that conversation with them. Turns 20 in June, by the way. June yeah. first, he turns twenty. So yeah, so he's—I mean—he's a young player who, at the development team, you know, he did go through some adversity, but he was never the guy there. Mm. You know, I—I I think Scott Wheeler did his thing. Like, who's the most underrated player in the program? And they're all like Snuggerud. That's because he was not the player that drove play. He was yeah. not the one that they all tied their ropes to and and waited to pull him across. You know, he could be a supporting guy. And even last year, 
he was not the star guy. He could he could kind of ride the coattails of Nyes and Faber and and Cooley, and and get his chances. And we see the offense. I mean, that shot is NHL ready, but it's the rest of the game when things aren't going right that are what's still missing. So when's the last time I looked? He's yeah. Let me see here. I think I think Pitlick just reached a hundred shots on the season. Let me see here. Yeah, I show Snuggerud at 167. Pitlick just reached 100 shots. Next closest is Brodzinski at 96. So he's getting the shots, Viggs. He's definitely getting shots, and that's not <laughs> that's not a fault. You know, he, he that's his game. Uh, it's, it's the entirety and setting the tone and being a leader that I think is the mm-hmm. room for growth there. And, you know, I know we joke that he's the new Sammy for me, but it's different. <laughs> it's very different. Uh, well, it, but this, some it, of the things are there. <laughs> we knew Sammy was going to be there four years. We just didn't want his. He was very much flat his four years. And, and Snuggie's kind of in that flatness. Yeah, he starts right off now. good and then turn, but he does it the season. He kind of goes up like this, and then he goes like this, and then he just he did the same last year. He was quiet from February on. I mean, he's a great talent, but what's his impact to the game other than his shot? You know, I don't think you can just be a one-dimensional player and continue to advance. You know, even guys who are power play specialists in the NHL, if you can't be a five on five player. It's hard to earn those top six mm-hmm. paychecks mm-hmm. because the teams just can't invest in that. This one's interesting. I've heard Bob mentions radio show. A couple seniors may come back next year. Any idea who? We know that um, Kester is eligible. Uh, Nevers is eligible. Fish is eligible. Um, I and, don't think- and Michael. Michael, I don't. He hasn't even played, but those three are eligible and they can come back. They're the last of the any players that are eligible to play the extra COVID season, correct, Viggs? Oh. <laughs> He's got a ball his nose. Viggs is a little under the weather right now. He's starting to lose his voice. Not a hundred percent. Playing hurt. <laughs> it's playoffs. Gotta yeah. play through it. No, but, but those, I, I those think we definitely would, could see Kester and Nevers back. Uh, I talked to uh, Tom Seratori, uh this month about the portal and just kind of, you know, going at his brain and, and picking it because he's done a pretty good job at Bemidji this year handling his roster management. And he said one of the things with guys who are going for that extra year, it's got to be the right fit mm-hmm. and you got to have a motivated player. They can't just come back because they don't have other options. You know, that's never going to be a good situation for anyone. If you just kind of come back, it's like, uh, I don't know. I don't want to get a real job and I don't really have a pro contract. So maybe I'll just come back, hang out, be a college kid for another year. That's not a reason to come back. Now, if you have a player who maybe hasn't gotten the opportunity to be a leader or maybe hasn't gotten the ice time that they've wanted or they're a late bloomer, those are good situations for a guy to come back. They've got something to prove and they're really motivated and they can add a lot to your locker room. But if you've got a passenger who just kind of comes along because they don't have anything else to do, that's not a good fit. So you got to figure that out before you put those two things together and invite these guys back for another year. Todd, I can see a certain Wisconsin player who is a high wild draft pick maybe hitting the portal and getting different scenery. I'm not saying he's gonna, yeah. but he may need a change of scenery. I've thought about that and I wouldn't be too surprised. No. Um, I think there's, um, you know, he, he, he gave it a run with, with the new coaching staff and, you know, let's see how it goes. And it became pretty clear, pretty quick that, he wasn't going to be a top six forward for them. And um, I think that 
that kind of wrecked his 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 confidence for for a good stretch. Um, and you know when you're when you've got that that billing attached to you, you you're not supposed to be a fourth liner, right? That's mm-hmm. it, not the way this is supposed to work. But um, yeah, I I think you're right that you can that would be that would not be a surprise to me that if if Stramel goes and and looks for somewhere else or you know i i, I don't know you know i i guess i i don't know you know someone would there's there's a place for him i just don't know what exactly it would be um i don't know i, I mean if i was on total speculation st thomas to play with jake ratzloff in the metro right, right. makes a lot of sense. I have no idea if that's actually a real possibility, but I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me just from the outside. Yeah. I don't know. He, maybe he could use a quieter year away from the twin cities though, too. Maybe. I just don't know what that looks like for him. You yeah. know, does he end up going to like Western Michigan you know, Fershweiler has done a pretty good job of developing oh. offensive players and, and giving guys a lot of run. And he kind of seems like he's okay with a mercenary player who just comes in and says, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Let's see what you can do with it. Hmm. And he's got that kind of challenging attitude. He's dipped into Minnesota recruiting. I'm sure he would know the the personality and the, the advisor side of it. That would be another option. But total speculation. Yep. That's what oh. we do in overtime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so St. Thomas gets knocked out by Lake State. We, we're we all kind of hoping St. Thomas could be successful just to see what happens to the CCAJ because it would be a good story, Todd, if St. Thomas wins the CCAJ tournament and the loser gets to go to the NCAA tournament. It would have just been a great but terrible story. <laughs> We're both, they're both out celebrating at the end of the game. Yeah. Yes. Both, all, both benches throw off. Their <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, that was, uh, and that's, Oh, what a gut punch the way they lost that. Oh game. yeah. Ew, the last the six seconds left or something like that. It was real late. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, you can see the path there now for him, right? You can kind of s- that there's they have a chance to own that league because that league is yeah. just now that Hastings is gone. Yeah, there there's so it, it's it's trying out for someone to to become the dominant team, right? And mm-hmm. um, um, I thought you know at, at one point, well, maybe there's a, a chance for you know a, a a Bowling Green or a Tech, you know, Bowling Greens and chaos right now it, it seems like oh boy are they? um tech is uh, should have been a lot better than they were this year and um yeah i don't and then and then there's just those teams that are you in in the ccha that are kind of like oh yeah they're they're still there aren't they it's like <laughs> like mankato Viggs, they're still there northern michigan northern michigan is the one that i was thinking of it's like yeah, oh, yeah. I, I I had a lot more in mind for that team. Um, I'm guessing Grant Patoni did too. Yeah, I I really thought when Grant went to Northern Michigan that he would try to early recruit mm. and bring in some kids at 18 or 19 that bigger schools weren't going to give the chance to, and just surround them with 21 year old freshmen. And it's just that's never happened there. He's never been able to land. A, a big recruit really in my mind mm. and if anything they've lost some players who have developed there through the portal and it's just a tough <laughs> tough look i think for grandpa told me i know every time people think about who's the next coach of minnesota and his name comes up and i just like i don't know <sighs> gotta show me okay i don't know who lucas pippen hagen is he's on he's on the mnc double a stuff Lucas, so friend of the show, so CCAJ I, expert. I don't know if he's a great recruit. Yeah, the Brock Besser story does not. That doesn't help. See, that's just does that, not that help the resume. Hurt. That kind of hurts him there, and it doesn't help that Brock put that out there either. 
Yeah, so Lucas probably liked my territory talk earlier. He does a lot of Bemidji State stuff. So yeah, we'll see. Bemidji is a team that could become a, you know, I don't, you know, power is probably a little strong there, but I mean, as long as they can keep some of the, um, you know, the the finances stable there, yeah. Um, because we know Bemidji is about hockey, right? That's they they've got that for them. You know, give me Tom territory any day. Um, yeah, I I don't know. Territory knows what he can do at Bemidji. Right, he right. Knows he knows the kind he, of player he, kind of, he can. He knows a window here, and and this is how we have to be to be able to to do something with it. Yeah, and he's dipping into international players a little bit here and there to supplement what he's got. You know, getting pole camp to stick with Bemidji was was big for them. I think it, it adds a little bit more flash and you know talent to their roster, as he likes to call it hard skill. Everybody wants hard skill. Well, pole camp's got it. Um, they've always had good goaltending at Bemidji. Whatever he does to recruit goalies, a lot of people probably could learn from that. You know, they've done well there. CCHA is interesting. It's a good place to prove yourself. And if you're a young coach and you go there and you struggle, it's because there's other good coaches in the league. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have your stuff together. All right, Biggs, you got to tell us about your Nelson Farm sweatshirt you got going there. Well, you know, I, I get to see uh, Chad Nelson every once in a while at the rink, and, and we were talking uh, back and forth about maybe, you know, jumping on board as a sponsor of the podcast. And he kind of you know, wants to be a little bit behind the scenes, but he's like, hey, here's a here's a hoodie for the Nelson family farm, and, you know, maybe there's some beef coming our way. We'll, we'll see. You know, he's had quite the journey with Jackson and his last year of college hockey, and he enjoys our product, and I enjoy uh, – getting the feedback and what we put together out there. So glad to have him behind us. And and how about how long he has been in the Minnesota pipeline Vegas since he was a freshman in high school or even before. Yeah. He was one of the young uh, recruits for Minnesota. And he was one of those players who, you know, had that temptation to go to Ann Arbor and, and be a development team guy coming from Laverne with small town hockey you know, where he's you know, leading the state in scoring as a freshman, sophomore type stuff. And he ended up staying, you know, kind of close to home in Sioux Falls for the USHL team. So he kind of bridged the gap there. And he's just gotten better each year, I think, with Minnesota. It'll be interesting to see where he ends up at the end of the year because, you know, six four, six five guys who can play center, who can win draws, who can play penalty kill, should have value, I think, as a pro. Uh, I don't think he'll ever be a high-end scorer, but he's got that depth that teams need and size. Speaking of young recruits, according to Mr. Brever, does Cruz Lucius bolt after this year? What do you think there, Todd? Yeah, I, if I had to take a stab at that one, I'd say probably, yeah. Um, I don't I don't I don't know where his next slot is, where his next level is. Um, but um, I, I don't know that you know, it, it goes, it's a little into the, uh, the Strabel discussion too, of like, he's going to want guys that fit more of his profile going forward. And, and I don't know if Cruz is that guy. Um, <laughs> That's... I mean, I just I put a little joke out there this week, you know, but you know about him getting traded. I'm like, did, did Mama Cruz approve of that? And it got a lot of retweets, and I somebody texted me like, yeah, "You just signed your death warrant with with <laughs> Tammy Cruz." <laughs> I'm like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> All in joking, of course, but it was it just it really cracked me up. Yeah, um, I mean, I that would probably be on. Uh, of, of guys signing that would probably be uh pretty high on my list of of probabilities yeah he's gonna be in for uh eye opener though in pro hockey you know it's gonna be a challenge for him it's not like it's an easy transition you know the ncaa is a pretty good level of hockey but ahl is a step up i think for guys like him who don't play a complete game 
So it, it's not like he's going to be go, going straight in the NHL. Now, it, I heard this this weekend that, um, you know, the school, his parents was a Gentry Academy, had started basically for those two. They basically just gave it away, and it's like a charter school now, Viggs? Something, are they not behind that school anymore? Or what's, do you, do you know? I don't know exactly, but it is definitely a charter school. It gets public funding somehow, which is a mystery to me how that works and still has all the athletic programs that okay, they do. Okay, okay. It's a mystery. There's a reason why a lot of schools don't want to schedule Gentry on their schedule or have them in their conference. So it's it's definitely a interesting part of the high school league uh, drama. But yes, it is definitely yeah. like an office building. It's like an office building, ridiculous. It's a damn parking lot, says Josh. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! But I don't know. We're we're seeing stuff like that, like Breakaway Academy in Chaska that Snuggerud's a part of. Uh, the Chan coach uh, Sean Bloomfield's a part of that operation. It it's kind of a weird situation where that's part of the educational system and the hockey factory i kind of feel like if you're going to be shattuck st mary's or north star christian there's an avenue for that <laughs> if you want to be the sioux falls power there's an avenue for that to, to take that it's very different than the high school hockey which is always interesting in the state tournament time i got to go to the double a game uh, last weekend after the gopher game which was exciting for a lose last uh, broadcast that i got to see in person so i didn't hear the broadcast but i saw all the tributes which were very cool they had him on the ice at the start of the game, and then they did Sinatra my way when he was on the ice, and then they did it again in the third period up in the booth, and there's like a standing O for Lou, which was pretty cool to be a part of. Who did they get to replace Lou? You know, it was talked about a little bit on the board today, and I'm like, some people are saying Casey Hankinson might be good. I'm like, can we get a nod in another Edina Cup? But the thing is, he would be good. Well, Casey did some gopher games when they were looking for a guy, and, and I think there was some room to improve there. I think Johnny Pohl did some games when they were trying to figure out who to do, and they settled on Climber. Climber's been okay. There's a lot of people on GPL that, that don't love him. He's fine. Yeah. Uh, but you don't replace Lou with just one guy. You don't want to be the guy who replaces Lou either. You want to be the guy that replaces the guy that replaces guy. <laughs> And, and I think some of that has led to some of the climber hate, though, too, Vix, because he kind of took over when the Wooger was, you know, let go. And that's that's just the tough position to be in for anybody, because the Wooger on MSC or Fox Sports North was a legend. I mean, you know, we got to see, you know, Lou once a year on the high school tournament. We got to see the Wooger all year long. I mean, I'd like to see like a Bruce Boudreaux be the <laughs> the next uh, color that guy was for pretty good at him. At a recent yeah, one. the trade deadline. <laughs> yeah, at least he wouldn't have to talk Not to Duffy anymore. Him. Yeah, <laughs> a guy like that would be good. I don't know who that would be, um, but a guy like Boudreaux would be awesome to see get a chance to do that. Oh boy, it's all fun. You guys got anything else? I don't really have much tonight. How excited are you for the bracketology, Todd? <laughs> Bob was kind of like, you know, I don't think anyone really cares until it's that last week. It's all fun. <laughs> There's so it many people fun. that put out bracketology yeah. articles, Todd, not to, you know, no, it's your work. Uh, Cause it's fun to look at all the issues that are going to come up ahead of time. But it is, it is, uh, there's a lot of them. These there, days. Yeah. There's been like almost every week. It's been the one that's just like, Oh, I, I hate this. And, and there was one week and it was, there was like three or four issues and you couldn't solve them all. And it, it just like, this would suck if this was, <laughs> this is what they'd have to come up with. Um, my but, kind of slant is I'd like to see a bracketology where we put the most controversial decisions into the bracket every week. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, BC, oh, you're going to go play Omaha in Omaha. Uh, <laughs> BU, oh, yep, you're going to play uh, North Dakota yep. and 
Sioux Falls or, you know, just the, like the least advantageous uh, matchup possible where you, you know, send somebody to Providence, even though Providence not the host or, you know, all right. that stuff. I think that's where we need to go next with bracketology. Yeah. Um, I uh, I don't know that I'll do this again next year. Let's put it that way. I mean, we're, we get <laughs> traffic on it, but it's like uh, this takes years off my life. It feels like trying to validate what what we you know. Okay, look back at this precedent, but know that they've gone this way, even though this is against their like we're you know with with the five teams from the NCHC being in the field. You, should you leave their first round game? Should you leave, uh, what was it? Uh, Denver, Western Michigan, right? Uh, it, if you go by the way the order shakes out this, this week, um, well, who's, whose precedent are you going by? Um, those are the things that frustrate me is like, um, there, and, and maybe it shouldn't because we have the benefit of at least having the the objective system where we know who's in. So at least there's that you, you give some subjectivity to the rest of it. Maybe we should be okay with that. Maybe I should just learn to accept that. And that's like, okay, fine. We'll we'll take the the pairwise system and the understanding of you know how this works and what you need to do and those kind of things. And the rest of it we can we can let be a little bit a little bit of a surprise. Can I can I do a request for if you do it next year? Sure. You look at the challenge that's in each bracket, and then you explain the history of what they've done in the past. Yeah, I so I started doing some um, I like just trial runs of this in January, and so it, as part of those, I was going back to a when when something weird came up, I would try to go back as much as I could find to find something like this that happened before. And well, this is what the committee done. It did at that point. Um, and it honestly, there were a couple where I found one this way, one this way. And then how do you, which one do you go with? How do you, how do you, you know, uh, reason through that? Um, well, you pretend you're a Big Ten official, and you reach into your pocket, and you either pull out a one or a two, and then you make up your mind. Which which marble? Which side has the fewer <laughs> marbles? Right. Yep. So, Viggs, what do they do if they do decide to go with a Schloss type in a, of an idea? You know, let's say that you know that eight nine are two Big Ten teams or something like that. Do they just get rid of that rule completely and just let them play, or do you? still kind of seed them one through four, you know, one, two, three, four seeds, and then do the home. I mean, what, how would you handle that? It feels like they've done the banding the most consistently of everything. Mm -hmm. So one through four in pairwise, you're one seeds, five through eight, you're two, you know, so forth. I think that's what they've shown they want to do. Yeah. Until they change how they select the tournament, that's what's going to happen. I don't know that there's a good reason to change that part of it. I, okay. I, I mean, I, I just don't necessarily see that. I mean, I, f I feel like you know, yeah, you could have the argument of, um, should we be using the pairwise to to pick the seeds and and all that? And well, that's that's the way it's been written. So that's how we're doing it. Everyone knows it. It's not a surprise to anyone. It's, it's, it's out there at the start of the season. So um, now it's not a surprise that if you're top eight, you get a home game. Schedule tougher, right? Do what you can to be in the top eight, right? That's no almost one, like making the tournament in the past, right? No one's got their thumb on the scale to say, well, we think there this nine is really should be an eight. Eh, let's 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 slide that up a little bit. It's it's. We know what the numbers are. We're probably going to be going at some point in the next few years to away from the RPI and to the NPI, uh, the NCAA percentage index that the women's um, tournament uses now. Uh, it's part of the women's pairwise. Um, and I'm people have described tried to describe what this means to me and how it works. I get about three seconds into it, and it's like, nope, okay, you lost me. 
it feels like the women's game has a tougher time weighing East versus West I because of the so scheduling. It. Yeah. Discrepancies. There's a lot fewer of the, of the crossovers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like at least in the men's game, there is enough crossover. And, and possible division of three least. as well too. I mean, it's, there's a lot less crossover East West in division three yet they still try to use it. And so you just kind of have to, um, at, at some point, maybe you just hold your nose and say, all right, this is it. If they were to go to the home teams hosting Vigs, would you try to keep the brackets intact or would you reseed the next weekend? I mean, that'd be awfully tough. You know, if a 16 beats a one, all of a sudden they have to go to the number two next week or do we just set the brackets and whoever's the higher seed following i think brad has fell over his vocabulary where he's talked about this a couple times i think you set the bracket and you go with it and i would approve that as well because it's just easier to figure out than the reseed and and that's the ncaa way that i think that's pretty standard in in every sport i I, the one i wonder about is baseball because of the super regionals but i think that's still bracketed all the way throughout it's just a um, double elimination in the super regional, but it's bracket. Yeah, but as far as like they don't change, you know, because if if the team that hosts uh in the the first weekend doesn't make it through to re- super regionals, they have to or both of those, you know, if it's the eight and the nine or whatever it would be, both of those teams lose in their regional. I don't know how they decide who gets the super then to host. So. I that's just my I don't follow it close enough to know. I'm gonna plead ignorance as well yeah. on that one. But I do like the idea of like you said, keeping the bracket integrity because l- let's just say a couple of home teams lose. Two lower seeds are gonna meet, and somebody who's a seed, you know, like nine, ten, eleven, twelve could host. Couldn't they? I mean we see a lot of four seeds upset one seeds just about every year we see one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be something you have to to factor in. And you know, maybe that's one of the reasons why no one has you know that that this has always been an idea and not put into practice. Because you're also talking about teams having to you know, uh, have a, a TV production in, in their building. And, you know, while we're getting there with a lot of buildings being being better around the country, and there are some that it's going to, it it would be, it would be tougher and it, would, it might not look as great, but I think, you know, we'd have to be okay with that. I think it'll be enough charm to make it interesting. That's the thing, right? You, you play it off as being, well, look at, you know, the big, big show is coming to, St. Lawrence. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, Butcher Grass is calling a game in St. Lawrence this week. Check it out. I think it'd be awesome. Let's make it happen. Have you heard nice. anything, Todd, about the regional discussion? I know no. Adams continued to, to beat the drum about it with his interviews, and I think uh, Schloss no. is still out no. there. Yeah, I mean, I, you hear about it, but I don't – I don't hear anything that says something's imminently going to change. And I guess that's where, um, you know, this, this comes up a lot because coaches will say, Oh, we need to do this, but they're not the ones that are actually making the decisions. So mm-hmm. they need to convince administrators. their their school administrators who need to convince the conference administrators, um, and I don't know how far along that line we've gotten yet on this. I don't think it's incredibly far is what I'm pulling away from things. I get the sense that Bob and Tom from the U want to stay as far away from this as possible. I don't think they win either way if they mm-hmm. advocate for one way or the other. And so they're just going to be on the sidelines and and vote probably at the end. Yeah, some people are are passionate about this, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. there's some people who really want to see this change happen, but I don't know that that's a, even a majority of coaches that are even like willing to 
put themselves on the, on the line for this. Um, and then how many administrators are we talking about? You know, the ones that are going to be fronting the cash to, to host an NCAA tournament game. Because that's the other part of it is that, you know, this does not happen for free. If you want to host an NCAA event, you got to have the cash to do it, put up a guarantee to do it. So there's some risk there. And, you know, you're, you're thinking you're going to make up, make your money back. Yeah, but I think the rules change if that happens, though. Well, there certainly won't be $200,000, $150,000 guarantee. No, I don't think there's that, but there's going to be something. Because, uh, like, yeah. even, you know, uh, I believe for the – when the women's – you know, because this is the other thing. The women's regionals are at campus sites. So, clearly, we're okay with that on the women's side. Um but even those, I think there has to, there's some kind of, um, you know, you you have to put up this much money to 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 be part of it. I don't know exactly what the numbers are there, but um, okay. Interesting. By the way, maybe Bob needs to take it to a second level and say, well, they think I believe this, they'll do this. You know, a little reverse psychology. Mm. Yeah, Don get he when he just talking about you know limiting, you know eligibility and the twenty three year old freshman type of thing. Just that talk about changing that got him in a lot of hot water, and it's just better for those bigger schools to just like you said. Let things Which is happen. interesting why David Carl is the one front and center on this, you know, maybe it's because he's out West and he doesn't feel the pressure of the big 10. Maybe media market. Who knows? All I know is that um, I'm hoping Minnesota gets to the, to the Sioux Falls regional because it seems like it's a nice setup. It's not too far away. Um, I don't think I would travel to uh, St. Louis. For that regional, eight-hour drive. If they go out east, I'm not going anywhere. But Sioux Falls seems like a good spot. I definitely want to go. I checked the uh, uh, the ticket page for Sioux Falls a couple of weeks ago, and it didn't look like there were a whole ton of tickets sold for there, which I was a little surprised by. There was still quite a few of it. I actually looked earlier this week to. Check it out myself. I saw the chat before our show started. People were debating it, so we'll see. Should we put a bow on this one? Yes. Yes. Okay. Appreciate uh, 461 people, maybe. No, I think that's. A, I think that's a total count. I think they total? changed their count. Eggs. I think they changed it to picking up the Twitter people. I'm okay with it. Let's 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 say it's 461. <laughs> Yeah, stop by Nelson Farms on your way out to Sioux Falls. Hopefully they go there. Ooh. Oh, there we go. V. Try to find some beef. I like that. All right. You're thinking there, Riggs. Good night, folks. You guys have a good one. We'll catch you next week.